I thought it might be instructive that with the market playing funny buggers last week to have a look at some of the implications for this for traders, but also to have a look at some of the broader metrics that traders turn to in an attempt to find some sort of comfort in this sort of market. The week that was, was an extremely exciting one. Virtually every world market was hit by wave upon wave upon wave of selling. Those of you who've paid attention to the blog will have seen this little league table go up in the past day or so. It simply looks at the performance of a smattering of world markets over the past week. The exception here is the Hang Seng. And that to me is a simple outlier because the Hang Seng itself has already been buffeted by waves of selling due to uh, student street protests. What is interesting here to me though is one or two features. The first is the selling among the very large broad indices such as the NASDAQ Composite but also the Russell 3000. What is also intriguing is the hammering that the DAX took. So we can see that all world markets have taken somewhat of a battering and our newspapers have been full of headlines such as this where the week has been referred to as a horror week. I need to make a, a, quite a, an important point about this and it is simply this. A falling market only has emotional energy if you lack the resources and psychological maturity to deal with it. The issue here is that markets go through these periods and that all traders need to be aware that these periods occur and that they need to have a plan to deal with them. Simply throwing up your hands in the air and running around around the kitchen until you bump into the fridge is not really a strategy for dealing with this sort of market. So whilst notions of referring to it as a horror week are somewhat dramatic and very much in the realm of hyperbole, they mean nothing to traders. And they mean nothing to traders because of the simple fact that all instruments have periods where they fall. It doesn't matter what the instrument is. It could be equities, it could be commodities, it could be FX. They all have periods when this occurs. So you either get used to it or get out. And that's a really very, very simple message. And it comes back to a very, very pertinent point. Large numbers of people who think they can trade or think they can deal with these market perturbations can't. They're simply psychologically ill-equipped to do so. And such people really need to find a different investment vehicle where volatility is not an issue, where the capacity of instruments to turn around and fall doesn't occur. Because without that maturity, you're prone to make silly errors. You're prone to make silly mistakes. But to the matter of looking at what's happening internally in markets. And I want to turn to a few metrics that I see appear every now and again, and to see if we can make sense of what they actually mean, if anything, to traders. What this little graphic shows you is the percentage of Dow stocks that are greater than an X period moving average. So along the bottom, you can see the periods 20, 50, 100, 200. They refer to the moving average in question. And you can see the percentage figures. It is to be expected that when markets fall, fewer and fewer stocks would be above various moving averages. That's to be expected. Because when price falls, it falls below a moving average. It's also to be expected that when you see this sort of metric, that shorter term moving averages will be more responsive. So you get this disconnect between the 20 and the 200. 
That's to be expected. 20 is more responsive than 200. And the thing that intrigues me is that when I catch news items from the US, they're often talking about the number of stocks above their 20 or 50 day moving average. This by and large is a meaningless metric. And it's a meaningless metric simply because in part what you're seeing is noise. 20 and 50 days are very, very short term glimpses of what the market might be doing, which is why I've included in here the period of 200, because it is slower. Therefore, it is less prone to whipping around. And this comes back to one of my default philosophies regarding equities trading. And that is that for equities trading, daily data, in my view, is largely noise. You get these perturbations that are meaningless. For example, if you switch on the evening news and you get a news report about what the market has done, let's say it's the all ordinaries and it's gone down by 20 points, you will hear that the market fell on profit taking. Bullshit. The market went down as a natural consequence of the normal volatility within a natural system. But that's too many words with too many syllables for a newsreader to cope with or for the average audience to understand. We need to make a distinction between noise and information. And with this sort of metric, you get a lot of noise, particularly when you look at them on a daily basis. And all I've done here is taken a snapshot of the 20, 50, 100, 200 day graft in Metastock. And you can see they're untidy, particularly the shorter time frames, and particularly on a daily period. So the question is, what does this mean to us? And I'll return to that in a moment and try and answer it. But I want to look at this looking at a much broader metric. And the much broader metric is the Russell 3000. If you're looking at US stock and you're following the Dow or you're using the Dow as your guide to decide whether to take positions in the US, then in many ways you're actually hamstringing yourself. And you're hamstringing yourself because the Dow is made up of 30 stocks, which is why it's called the Dow 30. The method of selection of these stocks is profoundly idiosyncratic, which in many ways, in my opinion, invalidates the Dow as a macro filter of any sort, simply because of the, both the idiosyncrasy of selection method and that the sample size is so small. You're talking about a tiny fraction of stocks within a very, very large dynamic market. You are much better off looking at something like the Russell 3000. And we get the same pattern when we look at our percentage of stocks above an X period moving average. Although the absolute numbers are actually smaller. And this is because this index is more representative of the US. It's a wider index. And we get the same pattern. We get the same appearance of what they look like. And these, these are very noisy little charts. And so the question becomes, do they convey any information at all? And my answer to that is, well, sort of. And by sort of, I mean there is some information locked in there but it's not where people think it is. People think it is within the trend, it's not. My belief is it's actually in the absolutes. So what I've done here is I've mapped the percentage of stocks above their 200 period moving average over the top of the Dow. And I've switched the periodicity to weekly so that we get a cleaner flow of information. 
What I want you to concentrate on are the extremes in the red line. The periods in between to me are meaningless. So there is some information conveyed in the notion that when 100% of all stocks within a given index are above their 200 period moving average, and when all stocks within a given index are below their 200 period moving average, that is telling you something about extremes of sentiment. You can see, and I, I use the word carefully, you can see divergence. I'm always careful about using that word because the moment you use it for traders, they instantly assume that when a divergence between two instruments occurs, that something will happen. Well, something will happen. It might just be months down the track. And so if we concentrate on the period before the GFC, you can see that the market was running hot and hard. And the number of stocks above their 200 period moving average was maxing out. Interestingly, that began to fall away. So the extreme has given us an anchor point, something we can see. And eventually, price caught up and the market fell over. It's important to, I think, consider that this, is, this may not be a cause and effect of a concrete nature. And this is the problem when you use the word divergence. People assume it is a given cause and effect relationship. And it may be, but that relationship may unfold over months or years. And we can see it during the depths of the GFC that the number of stocks above the 200 period moving average had collapsed. So it is in the extremes that we see something. And if I concentrate on recent history, we can see a similar sort of pattern. The red line is, of course, number of stocks above the moving average. Black line is the closing price. We can see this falling away. So we see extremes, we see price continuing, but the number of stocks above there moving average doesn't tend to follow through. Again, it is not a concrete cause and effect relationship. It is an interesting piece of information that adds to the puzzle. And we can see it when we look at broader indices. But here, the divergence in recent times is more severe. We can see that the number of stocks above this long-term moving average peaked some time ago and began to fall away. This does tell you something interesting about the internal dynamics or internal strength about a market. It tells you that while price is being driven higher, the engine that is pushing is having to work harder and harder and harder to do so. Because in effect, you've got fewer and fewer cylinders working. So you're revving harder and harder and harder to get the same result. And it's more distinct when we look at a shorter term time frame. If we look at the domestic market, we can see a similar thing. And unfortunately, I can't overlay this data because of limitations within the charting package that this data has held. But you see the importance of the extremes, the absolutes. The trend is not important, in my opinion. It does convey a little bit of information, but it's the extremes. And the intriguing thing about the domestic market is post-GFC how it has simply not recovered to the extent that the US market has recovered. The US market has lifted, depending on which index you look at, anywhere up to 160%. We're up about 60 So we have struggled along the way. So I want to return to the question as to what is the relevance of these metrics? The interesting thing about indices is that they are in many ways like super tankers. They're hard to turn around. So you really do need a shock to turn them around completely. And the past week, whilst it has been 
dramatic is to date not that sort of shock. We have had nasty falls across most of the world indices, which has been very good for those who know how to trade the short side of indices. But does it really alter someone's longer term investment perspective? Does it really alter someone's decision to pursue investment in a given market? This brings us back simply to the notion of price. And this brings me back to my notion that price is the guiding element in all trading decisions. This is our local market just charted weekly. We can see this channel we've been in for a little while. The cleanest part of our lift from the GFC actually occurred some time ago. Since then, we've been in this very, very noisy drift upwards that certainly hasn't had the characteristics of the movement up that the US market has had. This to me conveys more information than looking at uh, a collection of metrics, be it number of stocks above X period moving average, be it number of sort of cumulative high lows, uh, be it advanced decline lines. Uh, again, I default to price. What is price telling me? And the situation becomes noisier when we default to daily. I look at daily index charts because I trade indices on a daily basis and I find that works for me. But we still see the same thing. So we come back to this question that I, in a roundabout way, posed at the beginning. Does the noise mean anything to you? Does what has happened in the past week, irrespective of the metrics we use to measure it, does it actually mean anything to your broader investing or trading philosophy? I would suggest that if, for example, you were trading stocks on a weekly basis, it may or may not, depending on what measure you are using, to get you to enter markets and to stay in markets. I might suggest that what we've seen so far is noise. A very exciting noise, a very evocative and emotional noise, but it still might be noise. So as a longer term trader, the question you would need to ask yourself when you wake up in the morning and you hear that the Dow is down 150 points is, does that actually change your overall philosophy? Or is your philosophy a little bit like a super tanker and it would take a lot to turn you around? This brings me to my final point, and that is that if you have a system then noise is meaningless to you because noise is filtered out of the system. But that raises the question as to whether you have a system, whether you have a mechanism for dealing with markets that steps back from the headlines and in many ways steps back from a lot of the noise that these metrics generates and gives you some sort of guidance or some sort of structure as to when and how you are investing or trading. It may be that you might run a multivariant system, that you might be long weekly equities, you might be short daily indices, that's perfectly acceptable. Provided you have a mechanism that tells you when and how to do that. And if you don't have that mechanism, then certainly these very dramatic and emotional headlines will affect you. They will throw you off course and they will cause you to do something very, very stupid and very, very expensive when perhaps there was no need to actually do anything. 